Welcome everyone to this, the 14th World Shorthorn Conference, celebrating 200 years of shorthorns in New Zealand. Firstly, I must thank on behalf of the World Shorthorn Society, the New Zealand Organising Committee, for all the work they have done putting together this tour and conference. I hope those that have been on the tour around New Zealand have enjoyed themselves as much as I have. Remember, what happens on tour stays on tour, even blondes, fast cars and left behind passengers. As a farming industry that is in reality a food producing industry, we have big challenges to confront in order to produce the highest quality product of an ever diminishing land base. In the last few years alone, New Zealand has lost 17% of our most productive land to urban sprawl and lifestyle blocks. Something in the order of 150,000 hectares of land lost to food production forever. Further to that, we have a rapidly expanding middle class in Asia seeking a high quality food. The projections by 2030, China should have 1 billion middle class consumers compared to 360 million in the US and 400 million in Western Europe. Unfortunately, complicating this scenario is the ever increasing restrictions being applied by the democratic majority living within our cities. I fear reality and the understanding of what is required to produce food will not be fully understood by the majority until prices go through the roof and this will inevitably happen. More restrictions, more costs, more expensive food. The challenge for us is to produce more quality food from less. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. What Bill didn't tell you is that he's also my brother-in-law, and I'm very <laughs> proud to uh, be here today to support he and Judy. But also, I want to acknowledge all of you as outstanding uh, meat and protein producers, both from New Zealand and worldwide. Uh, our country is very proud of that history of production. The shorthorn industry has been enormously influential in the arguments around quality breeding, quality production and constant improvement. And I'm sure those of you who are visiting from abroad uh, share some of those values as well. Before I touch on, on Asia, and I'm keen to do that for you, I just want to build very briefly on uh, where we are. Uh, the welcome, uh, Maori welcome we've been exposed to this morning is very special, but I wanted to just remind us that here at Waitangi, uh, while our speaker introduced the concept of the treaty that was signed here, uh, the reason I want to raise it is that on the 5th of February uh, to, uh, 1840, Maori sat all along the foreshore that you look out on from this beautiful hotel. There were fires uh, in the evenings and people were debating whether or not they had the courage to sign a document that they weren't sure where it would take them. But in the end, as we know from history, on the 6th of uh, February to, uh, 1840, Māori and the then colonisers, Pākehā and, and the missionaries, agreed, even though things weren't certain, that they would take a step of faith. It's a special place. It is the birth of our nation in terms of the law and history as we know it today. And as our speaker also mentioned, it's still debated. It's a very vibrant document, and whether you agree or disagree isn't the point. It gives us a basis on which to engage. I want to challenge you, as you have come through this conference, uh, not only to think about what we know and what is certain, but also to think forward, because the treaty challenged us to do that. And I think it's terrific that you're here in Waitangi, right on the threshold of whether or not outstanding production industries like those in New Zealand can cut it in the emerging markets. I think it's as an exciting a question as the question that the people who sat on the foreshore faced. Not everything is certain. The markets are complex. We often don't really understand what we're seeing. Many of the things are not familiar, and yet much of our industry, the agricultural production industry that many of you and I grew up with, are very familiar. And so the question of whether or not we can bring this blend of what we know into an environment which is clearly extremely important and work out how to make it work in the future, I think is the question. 
Bill mentioned that I have a reasonable amount to do with Asia post-politics. Uh, as he mentioned, I'm on a, uh, one of the major banks in China, China Construction Bank, which is the second largest bank in the world now by market cap. I was very involved in China in my political career as they joined the WTO. And so I've watched both directly and indirectly the evolution of the trading environment. And for those of you who are visitors, you may or may not know that New Zealand was the first country in the world to have a free trade agreement between New Zealand and China. This sets rules that allows New Zealand in some situations to have preferential access to the Chinese market. But the things I wanted to talk to you this morning uh, about are really in this market space that your president referred to. Bill mentioned that we know that there are things changing, and just let me very quickly do the demographics. When I was born, there were two and a bit billion people on Earth. I was born in 1952. Today, we've topped seven billion people on Earth. In other words, the numbers of people who need to be fed are massively growing. As Bill also mentioned, the, the uh, hectare per person in production terms is dramatically diminishing. So if you look at the population growth and divide it by the land available in terms of arable put terms, we know that you as producers have to constantly produce out of your skin, whether you're producing milk or meat. The ability to do this in a highly productive sense with as least impact as the president referred to meet the expectations of the market is a complete and utter reality. The best demographers in the world tell us that the population is going to peak at about 9.2 billion people. So we're at a, just over seven, and in the next 20 to 25 years, they think the population will peak and then curve off the top because of ageing and other complexities that I won't go into today. So what do we need to know about China? Well, firstly, those who are projecting these things, and by the way, every projection should be viewed uh, with, with scepticism in terms of the detail, but an open mind in terms of direction. And what I mean by that is we could spend all morning debating Bill's figures, my figures or others on whether they're factually correct. But let me put on the table that the direction is absolutely clear that the amount of food required going forward, the best recent projections in volume terms is that we'll need 70% more food by 2050. In other words, the quality and use of food will change, but the volume absolutely is going to have to increase. And this will be driven by the middle classes. And again, I want to challenge you. The middle classes you know are like us. If you think about Western society, and I'm speaking generally here, there were about a billion people that we could describe as middle class globally, and they're mainly like you and I, in, in, in historic terms. Often the, the uh, people who have gone and settled countries, often of a similar European origin in one form or another, and very similar in values and expectations, often in cultural preference as well. In other words, the lens we look at for this middle class is familiar. But the reality of that seven billion people I referred to, the growing middle class is not like us. Often they have a very different cultural perspective. Often they look at food entirely differently. You and I look at food and talk about nutrition. If you come to Asia, they look at food in terms of wellness. Many of you, if you've sat down with an Asian family, they'll be patting you on the back if you're a gentleman and pointing to something on your plate and saying this is very good for men's virility or very good for women's complexion. The whole issue of Chinese medicine is a wellness concept. And we need, as producers in the Western world, to understand if we're going to market effectively, to see that that resonates with the consumer rather than us trying to tell them what's good for them. So to come back to the question of the middle class, in New Zealand it's certainly true that we are an affluent first world nation because we've sold to the middle classes historically. My challenge to you is do we know enough to be able to continue to sell to the middle classes in the next 50 years? And the challenge in that uh, point is not so much whether we are good enough, but whether we're smart enough to understand what we need to change not what the new consumer in the middle class needs to change in order to make that connection. The meat and protein demand is most certainly going to continue to rise. It's expected at the very least to double. 
And many of you from your different countries will see the demand cycle in terms of what you're selling into Asia astronomically growing. New Zealand continues to break records in both the, the red meat area and in the milk protein area in the volumes we sell. The real question is whether the value uplift that we're wanting from those volumes is actually occurring. And if I were hard on us all, I would say we are picking the low-hanging fruit. At the moment, the easy volume of basic quality is being sold into those markets. Whether or not we can work out where the veins are that give genuine value uplift, I think is still yet to be explored. And in my view, it won't happen from the production end of the market. It will only happen if you understand what the market is asking for and then produce and present in a way that resonates so the consumer is willing to pay for the, the value uplift. In other words, it has to speak to the consumer from their value proposition, not our production position. These are challenges which mean that we must invest in understanding much more about what's in the minds of these middle classes and what they need to, uh, to really prefer. Just to divert, you and I as red meat producers start from the back foot in Asia. Historically, red meat in Asia was eaten by poor people. At the moment, the proportion of red meat sold and, or consumed in the Asian market, and in particular in China, is still a relatively small proportion. Only 13% of all meat that is consumed in Asia is in the red meat category. And that's not a matter of not being able to afford. Often we flatter ourselves that we're at the top end of the market. Goat meat and sheep meat was seen as hard, often lacking in quality, and it was the things that the poorer people within the community, particularly in northern China, are relied on. So we have a huge positioning a repositioning issue to be able to try and uh, crack. The good news is that that is already starting to occur at the top of the market. If you see my last two points on the slide, I was checking the January figures, and China's imported red meat uh, in the January this year has surged by 812% year on year compared with last year. Last year, 0.4% of that meat was fresh chilled meat, it's up to 4% now, so 0.4 to 4% of all of the meat going in. So we're still basically selling frozen meat to China. The question of whether or not we can get into that high-end fresh meat, whether it's business to business or business to customer, I will come back to. But we are breaking through, and that's a good thing. Also, as I note, China is starting to consume more sheep meat. In the same month, that is January, 243% increase on the January before in terms of meat imported uh, worldwide. This is not just from New Zealand. This is sheep meat uh, taken in worldwide. I don't have the dairy figures, but I can tell you they're just straight line growth. Uh, anyone who is watching uh, milk production and the consumption of milk production in China will know that there is dramatic uh, intake increases. Uh, it, when I first went to China many, many years ago, it was rare to see people drinking fresh milk or even um, treated milk. Today, even at banquets, you will have milk served on the table. It is penetrating the market at multiple levels. It's an, also a fantastic offset if you're getting stuck into a big night of multi. Multi and milk almost offset each other. Multi is the hard liquor, uh, the rocket fuel in terms of alcohol consumption in China. And they have found that if you drink milk, it makes you uh, more able to have a good night out. So China is important, and there are many, many aspects we could talk about, but I want to just quickly challenge you not only on the Chinese market, but also some of the other emerging markets. Now, this is a, a, a demographic slide on the age profile, and I, I only give it to you as an illustration. If you're interested in tracking global demographics, there's a very good website called Global Demographics Limited. And I'd encourage you when you're searching on your search engines to just track some of the figures. And the only reason I wanted to give this to you is if you're talking to your companies or you're a leader, a director or, or um, senior manager, I think it's wrong or we'll keep making mistakes if we only sit and look at this year's annual production and trying to find a market for it. We have to come back and look at where the big emerging young markets are globally. As you will see, the Middle East, the vast majority of their people are under 30. 
In other words, this would be an investment market, but one that we need to pay attention to in the medium term. If you come down to the second to bottom slide, affluent Asia, you will see that in fact the demographic in the, the middle years, the, the 25 to 39 year olds and the 40 to 64 year olds is the largest part of that graph. The importance of that is that they are in that period where they have high levels of discretionary disposable income. In my view, the next 30 to 35 years in both affluent Asia and China, both of whom have that mature part of their economy, all of whom are, are on upwardly mobile income experience and increasingly have discretionary income. These are people who both meat and, wool, uh, meat and um, milk producers and to some extent wool producers need to focus on. If you love uh, tracking data, that demographic site is definitely worth um, looking at. I want to move to a completely different concept to challenge you. So you are outstanding producers, but what are consumers doing in China today? I came back yesterday from a board meeting in Asia, uh, in, in China, and I was astonished at the bank that we were presented with an e-tailing paper. And I thought I would share some of it with you. You might say, so how is this relevant to you? Well, I can tell you that what I am observing going on in China is one of the most dramatic megatrends, and I track megatrends globally. It's one of the most dramatic megatrends I've seen anywhere. Now, many things about China are massive megatrends, but this has happened only in about the last 14 months, and I'm completely and utterly gobsmacked at the speed with which it's moving, and I think it's relevant for those of us who are seeking to sell into Asia. There are 320 million people with smartphones in China. You might say, so what? They are already buying a disproportionately large amount of things they consume off their smartphones. 320 million is larger than the US population. So of the people in China, 320 million of them already are using their telephone to a far greater extent than you and I are in our economies to purchase, to bank, to look and search and to consume. The second thing that's fascinating is that they are not just shopping online. So they don't simply go and look at the beef shorthorn site and decide I will buy some beef shorthorn. They already have developed what they call e-markets. Now you could think of eBay or Trade Me as an e-market that is selling a defined set of products, but these are more sophisticated again. They are literally e-markets where people are now searching, not a shop by shop, but by product by product. So if I was a young woman and wanted a pair of trousers, I wouldn't just go to a Trelease Cooper site, for example. I would go into the e-market and specify what I was looking for, and producers, many producers of that type of product would be attempting to sell competing alongside each other on these e-markets. Now you might say, well, that's tough, and it sounds demanding, but it's where the mega trend is going. And what has fascinated me is that already this is taking off not only in business to customer, but also business to business. Now recently I was looking at how you and I as New Zealand meat producers um, have our uh, plate, oh well sorry, paddock to plate costs fall. And those of you who know the old arguments of how much it gets to cost to get to the port, how much it then gets to cost to get to the country and then through to the market, you will know that constantly your margins are eroded. I think that e-tailing is something that even those of us who are a distance away, we need to absolutely change the way we're thinking. In my view, it potentially has the opportunity for us to completely redefine the way in which primary industry businesses sold into global markets, and I can tell you already you have massively mature purchases sitting there with discretionary income starting to want to search for how they are going to buy almost everything. Of the Chinese market currently, which last year sold $280 billion worth of goods across this platform, only 14% was food but the fastest growing category of consumption is food. So in other words, while it's not the most dominant, the most dominant is clothing on the e-tail platform, but food is the rising opportunity.
And one of the things I personally think we should be exploring, whichever country you come from, is whether or not business to business, on an e-market platform, you can present a range of product in particular volume and it effectively be like an online auction or an online purchase where you th will then be able to directly um, uh, deliver. Now people will say to me, this sounds too expensive. I can tell you that if you look at even the distribution cost in China, you lose 44% of your margin once you've landed in China and then get into the distribution system between when it's landed and when it's sold to the consumer. There are many arguments that if you drop this flat and think about how you then use logistics between the business and the customer, you may well find that far from it being too costly, it may well improve the competitiveness entirely, but it will form that relationship between your product and a consumer that may then give a different type of enduring market than we have been used to. You may dismiss this and say, it sounds too hard, it sounds too complicated, and it's not relevant. In my own view, those of us in the productive industry in New Zealand and globally, if we don't understand this mega trend, we almost certainly are going to miss out on it. And what I observe here in New Zealand is that many Chinese investors get this. They know where outstanding sourced quality can be procured from, and they are already investing and then trying to e-market this, this foreign sourced product into their own markets. In other words, if we are not careful, they will beat us at our own game. There are huge opportunities here for the primary sector if we can think our way through from a market perspective on these new platforms. The traditional food chain is costly, and I want to challenge you that when we think about paddock to plate, we have to be honest with ourselves. Many primary industries, as we've currently know, or historically known them, in my view, will not be able to sustain themselves in productivity terms. The cost structures, if we keep trying to do what we've always done, will almost certainly mean that the producer at the, this end of the market is going to be squeezed out. So we have to demand of those who are marketing for us that they are thinking differently. The old arguments of what it costs to get to free on board point frankly is irrelevant. You have to be prepared to debate the cost of from production to plate in whichever market you are debating. And we need to have an open mind. I can tell you China is changing the paradigm here and it is a huge opportunity if we can think differently. I'd encourage you to be suspicious of people who raise protectionist arguments and uh, other food security arguments, and I only put that on the table because I think it's going to re-emerge again. And for those of you who are outstanding producers of goods and services from whatever corner of the earth you come from, while it's a temptation to try and protect your industry, those who try and do that will be beginning the first step to the demise of their industry, in my opinion. The worldwide financial system in whichever country you're living in today cannot support the subsidization of agriculture. I just do not think it's going to sustain itself. So those of you who are already completely competitive continue to strive to be so. For those of you who haven't yet made the change, I'd encourage you to come to terms with it because in my view there is not the capacity uh, within governments with the debt profile that most of the Western economies have got to be able to continue to do this. And while it's been able to be done in a short term, the competitiveness of labour cost alone is leading governments to understand that this is not something that they can sustain. So we are dealing in a world market and we have to quickly work out how to do that. I want to very quickly conclude on two or three comments that I hope will be useful. As difficult as it is, it, as it is I'd encourage you to be strategic about this. Doing what you've always done will have you going backwards. Uh, I know that that's a provocative statement, but I'm happy to debate with any of you whether or not it's true. I have not found any part of the food production sector that is able to stay the same and is continuing to progress. And so I want to encourage you as you debate at this conference what you need to do next to have an open mind about the possibilities. There's no question in my mind that while we have been great investors in agricultural terms, the next strategic investment will be investing in people. And those people will not be the production-led people that you've been familiar with. You still have to do that, 
but the next strategic investment will have to be with people who know stuff you don't know. And it may well be about e-markets, or it may well be about consumers and their preference. It may well be how to make your production link with their expectations. Cultural design that resonates is critical. You know, we still send beautiful lack racks of lamb and hope that Asia will appreciate that. Now, a rack of lamb is a rack of lamb, but why we don't think about, for example, the Asian uh, events and celebrations, and by the way, Asia celebrates almost everything, almost every week. There's a moon festival, moon cake festival, or uh, there's Chinese New Year. There are many, many festivals. If I were a marketer today, I would absolutely do a cultural SWOT analysis of the Chinese calendar, and I would be trying to ensure that whatever we were selling in some way resonated with the discretionary income preferences as people celebrate those events. So think of a, 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 a um, rack of lamb, why we don't call it the Empress Crown, for example, a, a New Zealand sourced Empress Crown, I do not know. And I, I mean, it, does it matter to us? I can tell you it matters to them. If you speak to them, and quality meat, a celebration of high quality New Zealand source product that allows them to think about perhaps a Chinese New Year event where everything imperial is celebrated, why wouldn't we do it? And these are simple concepts where there's a value uplift proposition that I think we need to explore. So when I say to you, cultivate design that resonates, it's a cultural challenge that not always thinking that we are right and we know best, but rather what's in the mind of the people we're seeking to sell to, and how can we position our outstanding products in a way that resonates with them. The Moon Festival's another example. They, they buy moon cakes galore. You know, why we wouldn't use either a fillet steak or something, you know, perhaps a sirloin steak, something high quality as a moon steak from New Zealand as part of that uh, festival. Again, these are huge opportunities sitting under our nose. I want to leave you with these two images. The little boy I met in a, a trading market. Uh, Chinese are margin traders. In other words, they're as smart as hell. And anyone who thinks they're going to trick them, forget it. It's hard doing business in China. It's demanding doing business in China. And investing in your people, you have to put people on the ground there. I know if Fonterra was here today talking about the, the, the uh, San Lu uh, issue, they would say had they invested in far more people on the ground to protect their f uh, uh, quality of supply chain and, and the logistics, they may have been, not would have, may have been able to avoid the calamity. And while you can say, well, is that our business or theirs, if you're going to do business in any other country, it's your responsibility to make the investment that will protect that investment properly. And the right people in the right place at the right time is still an extremely important part of thinking about how to effectively enter the Chinese market. I want to leave my last comments to the little girl on the right. This is Tajiri. She lives in Namibia. Burton and I spend a little bit of time in a wee project in Africa. But Tajiri is four, uh, 15 years old now, and uh, Reese, oh, it was four years ago, uh, we were there, and Tajiri is... Um, a fine young woman who lives in the very northern part of Namibia. We had been filming her and she'd been talking about her life. And she then said to my daughter Anna, I want to ask you some questions now. The first question she asked was, do you live with your mother? In Namibia, if you live with your mother, mo women do most of the hard work, by the way, in Namibia. I won't, won't say any more as to whether they do it here in New Zealand, but uh, they, 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 women are revered in, in that respect. No, Anna didn't live with her mother. Jenny lived in New Zealand, and she lived in London, and Tajiri had hardly been to the capital of Namibia. So these were complex concepts. Anna's boyfriend was with her, and she said, so are you married? A young woman in Namibia, if she was uh, lucky, would be married by 16. Uh, if she was unlucky, I would argue she'd be married by 12. Uh, and if she was educated, she may be married by 20. Here's Anna at about 34. No, I'm not married. This is my boyfriend. So Tajiri looked at her and said, so do you have any land? Anna said, well, when we were little girls, a little girl, we had a big farm and lots of land, but we don't have that land anymore. But we do have some land in London. Andrew and I own a house and we have land in London, but it's just a little bit of land. So Tajiri looked at her and said, so do you have any cattle? Anna said, well, we used to have a lot of cattle when we lived on the farm, but we don't have any cattle anymore. Cattle are collateral in 
Africa. If you are a farmer with many cattle in, in a country like Namibia, you are rich. And you don't even so much count your cattle if you're a herdsman, you simply know that your cattle are there and they represent your wealth. So Anna had to say to Tajiri, no, I don't have any cattle. And Tajiri looked at Anna and said, you are very poor. Now at that point, Anna was the communications and marketing manager for Nokia for China, Japan and Korea. And I le tell you the story because it illustrates the fact that it depends what set of eyes you look at to form a view. By the way, Africa is the next best thing after Asia. The Namibian economy is growing at about 7% and I believe particularly in central and southern, well, in the southern part, Botswana, Namibia and South Africa, there is some very significant emerging economic power there and while it's not right there now, it's very important. But Tajiri's message to you, and I want to leave you with this challenge, this is uncomfortable stuff because we always think we know what we know. It's what we don't know that will limit the success of our industry. And the question of whether we've got an open mind to make the change into Asia that needs to be made is still a question. It frustrates me that I have been talking about this, as have many others, for over a decade now. Asia is not waiting for New Zealand or Australia or South Africa or the UK. It is bolting ahead, working out how to solve problems. The question of whether we can adjust quickly enough to have a slice of this next huge emerging middle class is not up to them, it's up to us. I wish you well as you consider this conference and consider what you do next, and I want to simply encourage you to move ahead decisively. For me, the agricultural sector is still an absolutely outstanding part of the New Zealand economy, and frankly, we could not survive without it. But if you still ask me where the greatest opportunity lies, it's in the agricultural community. But it's not doing what we've always done. You are still outstanding producers and you'll continue to seek improvement in that space. It's whether or not we then can transform what we do, not only speaking to the middle class, the shoaling fish we know, but rather also still doing that, turn our minds to east and west and discover ways in which we can do business with people we don't know, but who are hungry to understand and have a share of all the outstanding production that you are so very good at. Thank you, I wish you well uh, as you explore this conference over the next day or two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mangini. Um, we're truly honoured to have you here, with, and especially with your, your experience and, and the subject you've been speaking about, and, uh, and you've certainly laid some challenges down for us, and uh, I'm sure we'll all be looking to accept those. Thank you very much. <coughs> right. Um, the next... Where's my place on the page? Here we go. <coughs> um, first, next we have the country report from the UK, and uh, Frank Milne, here we come, here we come. Thank you, Frank. There we go. Thank you very much. I'll just give you the introduction. Um, Grant's current role at the Alliance Group is, is sales manager uh, for beef. He's been in this area for, for 10 years, predominantly looking after um, America. So uh, he's, he's been employed <coughs> by Alliance for, for 28 years and uh, began when Alliance was had one plant operation and now we have nine in total. So thank you, Grant. We'll look forward to your address. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, on behalf uh, of Alliance, it's a pleasure being here this morning. It certainly is a... Uh, a very nice place to come to and tough act to follow actually, uh, the speakers that have gone before me, but we'll do our very best. Um, I'm going to do it in three stages this morning. Uh, a little bit about Alliance, who we are, what we are and uh, what we do. Then a little bit about the markets itself and uh, where the global beef economy is at, at the moment and the part that Alliance slash New Zealand play within that. Currently, we, as uh, John said, we, we started, uh, Alliance was formed in 1948. 
and then we started with one plant basically in Invercargill which is uh, way down the bottom for those of you that visited just not too far from obviously Mount Linton. Uh, as time has progressed over the years we now find ourselves with nine plants. Uh, we bought two different companies at two different times. We bought C.S. Stevens in the uh, late 80s and then we bought uh, Waitaki uh, in uh, early 1990 and then from there we've also established uh, two plants now in the North Island. So most of them are rel relatively new as you can see from there. Danivere built in 2003, Levin was built in 2007 and in Nelson obviously we uh, revamped, totally built the place in uh, 2000 and Smithfield, again, we've uh, shifted our venison processing plant from Christchurch down to uh, Timaru. And then we've also spent, uh, or continuing to spend money on our Longville plant, which is right down south. And uh, over the last 10 years, we've spent, as you can see there, a quarter of a, mil a, quarter of a billion dollars in further processing and developing our plants and trying to bring into continuing to keep them up to date. Where we are today and, and what we process as a company, we process uh, 5.9 million lamb and uh, just under a million sheep. From there, within the New Zealand industry, we're about 30% of the lamb and about 28% of the uh, mutton. Cattle, uh, not quite so large. We do about 210,000 animals. From there, we're only about 10%. There are three, for those that are interested, three larger companies being Silverfern Farms, uh, AFCO, and then the ANSCO Group. And from there, Venison as well, we're about 28% with 115,000. We spread that, as you saw, across the nine plants. Now, our uh, latest venture at the moment, uh, we too have a website, obviously, and uh, are moving into a new packaging range. We've gone away from being uh, promoting the Alliance Group. We are now promoting Pure South, uh, which has evolved since 2002. It was first originally used as a lamb brand, which we use in the uh, UK. Today, we're rolling it out across all markets uh, into Asia, North America, and across all product lines, being beef, venison, and uh, Bobbyville as well. So on the left hand side there is the old brand and then on the right hand side is the new Pure South brand. Uh, as I said, it was introduced in 2002. Um, the main aim now is to consolidate our existing brands and also the original elements as you can see there are lush green, which you might argue at the present time having toured around the countryside, it's a little bit on the brown side. However, uh, the concept is uh, it's pure, it's fresh, and it tastes good. And these are some of our uh, uh, products in the new branding. You can see there on the top left, the new carton. So we've gone away from being uh, a plain brown one to, with the red and blue logo of the company to now Pure South. And as part of our sponsorship also, we are investing in the New Zealand rowing. Hence the reason you can see the rowers in the background there. Uh, we're also uh, very strong in promoting grass-fed beef, obviously. Uh, in New Zealand, for those that don't know, we only have the one feedlot. Uh, the rest of the country, out of the 2.2 million animals that we slaughter every year, are all majority grass-fed. And uh, there are a number of reasons, which I'm all sure you're very familiar with, as to why grass-fed is so much better for you. I'm not going to go into it. The presentation that I'm presenting obviously will be available at the end, so there's no point in, um, I'm sure you'll get sick of looking at figures and that, especially by the time I've finished. As for the world scene, uh, it's already been touched on earlier actually, um, that the growth and the population is considering expanding rapidly. In the 1987, you can see there that we're at 5 billion, and as Jane Jenny pointed out, it continues to grow. And, as you can see there, that prediction is uh, 8 billion, but there's, who knows where it's going to stop. So it continues to grow at an enormous rate. And obviously, um, for us, being in the food business, it's certainly the uh, way to go at the present time. 
As I say, population uh, worldwide is growing, consumption is increasing. Uh, even with 8 billion people, it only takes a small portion to eat uh, beef, lamb, or whatever the case may be, and their wants are enormous. Um, there are major domestic producers, EU, South America, and China in, are inclined. Again, as it was touched on earlier, uh, land use is being swallowed up at an enormous rate. So we're having to get a lot better, uh, a lot more smarter at how we do things. And for New Zealand, we are uh, somewhat removed from that a little bit in the respect that we only have you know, 4.5 million people in the country, whereas our nearest neighbour, for argument's sake, uh, Sydney has that in one town. So we're quite lucky. We have enormous resources here and wide open spaces. Uh, now a little bit on the uh, global beef scene, I guess. Uh, as you can see from there, this is uh, taken from a uh, conference that was had last year. And we'll put it into a simple pie graph uh, as to the major producers of the company, uh, of the world, sorry. This is the top 10. And as you can see from there, United States, uh, clearly the largest, followed by Brazil and EU are all combined in there. And then China, uh, obviously, which is fourth and uh, 12%. Now, to put it in, in perspective, you'll see there that uh, Australia is 5%. Now, Australia has a $14.2 uh, million slaughter. New Zealand has a 2.2. So uh, it pales into significance why we are no longer, or we are not present on this graph. As for the exporting of uh, beef, it changes somewhat. Uh, India goes to the top. A lot of it with uh, buffalo meat, which is um, exported into the southeast east region, into Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, combined a lot there. Australia has jumped, obviously, now to being the second largest exporter. Brazil, third, and United States drops to fourth. And this is where New Zealand starts to appear. Obviously, with again, with the 2.2, a uh, million dollar herd and only a 4.5 million dollar population, we have to place it elsewhere. Basically 95% of New Zealand's uh, meat e is exported, there's only 5% consumed domestically. And then the imports. Uh, on the opposite side, Russia uh, is the number one importer of product, United States second, Japan third, and then Vietnam, Korea, and down into the EU. So there are some uh, significant changes there from uh, who is a producer to an exporter and to an importer. Obviously, uh, USA plays a very large part in all three of those. And uh, on the imports. So these are some stats. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with these. Basically, in short, uh, there are two islands here within New Zealand. 75% of the beef slaughtered within New Zealand is in the North Island, and only 25% of the beef is slaughtered in the South Island. Uh, it has changed a little over the past few years as we've seen dairy move further south uh, due to the climatic conditions. In the bottom half of the South Island, it's been known to be rather cold, grass doesn't grow, and it's always difficult to take animals through to the proper term in the time frame required. Most people don't wish to take beef, for example, through to a second winter period and they'll uh, have them slaughtered before there. So uh, the mix changes a little between islands, uh, but again, uh, these slides will be available for you to uh, look at. And of course, our percentages uh, have changed somewhat over the last few years. If you look back in 2007, uh, Alliance Group were slaughtering 57% steer. As time has evolved, dairying has become more stronger, more populated, more profitable uh, to some extent as well, that we have reduced our steer kill. And uh, on the back of that, the cow slaughter has uh, increased significantly as well. So as a company, our uh, profile has changed over the last few years. We've continued to expand in both, uh, certainly in beef. Unfortunately, as far as lamb goes, uh, it's diminishing, and I guess that's on the back of how well dairying is doing and uh, land use change within uh, the South Island. 
This is a reflection of the Alliance Group cattle kill and part of the nature of the business that uh, we have to deal with. Week one there is uh, the 1st of October at the start of each year and obviously week 52 is the 30th of September. That's our uh, fiscal year or financial operating year. Now you can see there that uh, we start off slow. This is a, a combined kill for Alliance Group. Uh, it starts off slow pre-Christmas and has a uh, small period in January where it's quite quiet and then builds up towards March, April and May where we are very, very busy and that is totally uh, a cold cow kill on the back of the dairy industry changing uh, their mix, uh, reducing the age of their herds and uh, then obviously for us in July, August, September we basically uh, have no kill whatsoever. So you can see um, on the steer kill, it's all over the place, I guess. Um, but the point being, the heifer and the cow kill make up the bulk of our period. Now, in a 10-week window between the end of March, the end of June, we slaughter as a company half our processing numbers. So we're doing 10,000 animals for 10 weeks, which is about a, just over 100,000, and we only do 220,000. So apart from those 10 weeks, you can appreciate for the other 40 weeks of the year, we're, we're struggling to find uh, supplies on a regular basis. And it, in New Zealand, unfortunately, at the moment, there is surplus capacity within the industry, and we're all competing for that uh, livestock. So the bull kill has uh, been and gone. January, February are when we slaughter the majority of those animals. And currently at the moment, due to the climatic conditions, obviously with being dry around the countryside, the whole kill pattern is coming forward. And as you can see there from the Matara side of things, uh, the cow kill is, is well forward on where we would be at this normal time of the year. Again, that's a reflection on uh, climatic conditions and where we find ourselves today. Right, New Zealand's uh, destinations as to where we uh, place our product. As you can see there, our largest uh, product out of New Zealand or our largest market for product leaving New Zealand is USA. Um, I'm going to go through these country profiles one by one in a little bit more detail, but um, number three sitting there is China. Now, effectively, that's come from nowhere, as the New Zealand industry goes. And some of the other graphs that I'm going to show you will show uh, how reliant we are now uh, becoming on China. Uh, Alliance Group total turnover is about 1.2, 1.3 billion. Our largest individual client last year was a Chinese client, and they were about $100 million. So that's just one client alone. So we are very, very reliant now on China as a market and some of these stats will uh, be it to that fact. Uh, Korea there is second, China third, Japan and Southeast Asia there fourth. <coughs> now there are a number of reasons obviously as to why uh, USA is the largest client. For every animal that uh, we slaughter on the beef scene, approximately 40 to 45 percent of that carcass makeup is what we would deem to be manufacturing product i.e. it's basically bound for hamburger meat. The largest company in, or country in the world today that buys product for hamburger meat is USA. They uh, have a herd themselves of about 90 million. Most of it is grain fed and on the back of there being grain fed a little bit fattier, they prefer uh, a New Zealand grass fed beef so that they're able to blend it in with their own processing product to make a decent hamburger. So USA itself, um, the prices we're achieving today are the highest, the highest that they've been. Um, in the last three years a container of product has gone from 40,000 now to double the value of it. So it's gone to 85,000. What that means, obviously, is that most of the product that's brought into America is through importers. So they have effectively had to double their cash flow lines, which has put a little bit more pressure on them, a little bit more pressure on their banks. However, having said that, uh, it's still sustainable at this present point in time. 
and uh, the market looks very, very good for us. The, uh, the domestic in uh, USA is competing for, as you can appreciate, most of the product slaughtered in uh, USA is from grain fed lots. So therefore they are obviously having to compete with high grain with the biofuels, uh, which has really taken off. Corn now is uh, uh, a sought after product and depending on whether they've had a great year climate wise or a poor year climate wise will determine on how well the beef business is doing as well because the majority of corn these days is going into ethanol. It's being subsidised strongly by the American government. And they, as you can see there, it's being put into a fuel blend. Most of the current feedlots in North America and USA at the moment are struggling financially because they're having to pay very high prices for their uh, grain. They're also having to compete in, uh, with the currency as well. You saw there that uh, on the pre previous ones where they are still one of the largest exporters. Fortunately, that may well change because the largest market that USA was putting product into was basically China. Now, USA and China don't have a protocol and a lot of the product, or all of the product, was going through what was deemed to be termed the back door. Uh, it was going in through Hong Kong, it was going in through Vietnam, and through a number of, uh, some through North Korea as well. So illegitimately it was going into the market, being found on all the tables and for a number of years the Chinese government have been allowing the US to put product in there and have been quite happy with that. However, what they've come to realise now today is that not only is beef going in through the back door, but they don't know what else is going in through there. So they've now decided to tighten up all their uh, border controls and you'll find now that USA is no longer allowed to export to China and that in itself has opened up the door for both, uh, there are five countries which I'll come to uh, further on the track. Now New Zealand does have a free trade agreement with USA uh, and our tariffs there at the moment are only two US cents per pound. Uh, long term outlook for New Zealand into North America is pretty good because they themselves through their own uh, herd has diminished. It used to be at one point in time well over 100 million. Today it's down to about 89 million. So they too have gone through uh, um, dry times and uh, climatic wise I should say they've had droughts and uh, that has forced a lot of animals to be killed. They haven't rebuilt any of their herds now for a number of years and as soon as they start uh, rebuilding their herds that too bears well for New Zealand. Uh, as I touched on earlier, most the reason that uh, USA is so long, uh, so large in uh, New Zealand's market or dependence is, as you can see there, from steers. About 44% of our product goes into manufacturing. Again, hamburger meat, uh, heifers, cows, and bulls. As it goes, it gets bigger. So, currently at the moment, uh, for manufacturing-based product, New Zealand has very little other options for people that will take it in and grind it. There are some product going into Japan, some product going into Indonesia, but nowhere near on the large scale of what uh, USA is taking. Korea, the second largest market for New Zealand currently, is heavy, heavily influenced by tariffs. Uh, as you can see there, it's 40% on beef. USA was banned from Korea in 2003 due to the BSC being found, which was great for New Zealand. Uh, prior to that we were very small, had only 9% 9, 9 of that ma market um, over the years as, as time has progressed and now at the moment USA are allowed back in there. So we can see uh, from the next graph uh, how it has affected us. Predominantly the market itself takes rib cuts, that's basically your bone and rib cartilage with a little bit of meat, it goes into uh, soups and you can also see there that they, t well, RER means uh, cube roll, sorry. USA has a free trade agreement with Korea, which New Zealand and Australia do not. So therefore their advantage is uh, quite significant. And uh, they have a, a lot less uh, tariffs to pay. It is a valuable market for us. However, it is under tight economic pressure and it's struggling with its GDP. 
So if we look at uh, this graph here, you can see 2003, this is pre-BSC, New Zealand had 9% of the Korean market. USA had 67% of it. Again, because of the free trade agreement that they've had, Australia 22%. As uh, time has progressed, now USA is in the process of being declared BSC free again. Um, they've been able to do that. The isolated cases that they had were supposedly that isolated. So they've been able to come back in under a uh, same conditions as what New Zealand and Australia are now and basically be declared free of BSC again. So where does that leave us? Uh, we did in 2010 move to 13% of the market. 2012 we were down to 10 and then obviously in today for the first three months of the year we're back down to 9% which is pretty much where we were BSC just fr uh, prior to BSE being established in the USA. And the bulk of the product, as you can see there, for Korean imports is the bone-in product, the short ribs. Uh, and the ribeye roll there is following on behind it. Japan uh, has been traditionally uh, a very important part of uh, our markets. It's been a strong buyer of beef. Um, New Zealand has been number two into that market behind Australia. Uh, Australia has a very distinct advantage in the respect where it's geographically placed, it's closer, it's cheaper uh, freight-wise. So they, they have some e economic uh, woes which have, um, well, major problems post-earthquake. I mean, we're all aware of the problems that they've had as far as that goes. Uh, they have a shrinking population, they're struggling uh, with manufacturers. Uh, what has happened there in uh, the last wee while is that they have devalued their dollar in order to try and strengthen or assist the manufacturers in uh, promoting business. In December 2012, obviously, the yen was devalued by approximately 18%, which has been a major boost to uh, exporters, but it's been a major problem for the importers, and uh, they're having to pay a lot more higher for it. And uh, Japan, if anyone has done business with Japan, they uh, are not... Uh, how can I say this, people that will make a decision lightly, they like to procrastinate, think about it, look at their other options, see if they can buy it anywhere else and uh, a day-to-day -day trade may take you three or four days there whereas a lot of the other countries we're dealing with, the decision's made on the spot, the price is okay, bang, it's done. This talks of, of free trade happening uh, but not yet. The biggest uh, issue with Japan that New Zealand uh, holds is that again pre BSC we were uh, number two. Since BSC, when uh, uh, Japan re refused to uh, take product from North America unless it was under the age of 20 months, they believed that cattle under the age of 20 were not subject to having uh, BSC. One wonders why, but you know, that, that's their prerogative. Uh, they have recently just changed that so that they have now opened it up again back to the 30 month old animal which is what it was prior BSC. How that will affect New Zealand? Uh, certainly one of the largest volumes of product that goes into Japan is the beef tongue. Uh, it's a delicacy in Japan and pre-BSC the price to give you an example was about $2 US a pound. Uh, during BSC where USA was excluded from their market it got up to about ten, twelve dollars a pound, which effectively made it more expensive to import than tenderloins. So uh, they're very passionate about their tongue and it's one of the only markets in the world that for whatever reason prefer to eat beef tongue. So unfortunately today's price is back to where it was about previous E, which is just over two dollars US a pound. Uh, and the restaurants themselves, um, again the Beef tongue is a, uh, a product that is eaten at a restaurant and again because they were struggling financially um, they didn't eat out and therefore obviously that's the other reason for the market going backwards. The other one is they are very strong believers of uh, grain fed beef. Um, they have invested a lot of money into the Australian industry and as you can see there uh, they prefer their meat virally very heavily marbled and fat. 
not quite what uh, I would prefer, but each to their own. Indonesia was a very large part uh, and growing on our uh, market. It uh, got up to 92,000 tonnes of product imported, both it's collectively and uh, from New Zealand and Australia. We were starting to put manufacturing product in there for their beef wool business. Uh, it was growing and it was giving us an alternative to USA. However, from there, uh, the Indonesian government has decided that they are going to become self-sufficient in beef. So they have uh, reduced the tonnage to 34,000. Um, and in doing that, obviously, it's dropped uh, New Zealand and Australia's ability to export manufacturing product in there. They also have a number of other issues going on in there. Um, they've got corruption at the ministerial level, um, which is not going so well. There's a three-tier market there, obviously with their domestic production, uh, the import of beef, and the Australian live cattle. Now, in order to become self-sufficient, obviously, they wish to grow their domestic production. But what an actual fact has happened there, because they've reduced the quota going into that market, therefore it's made less product available on the scene, uh, local scene to purchase, which has in force driven the prices up and in driving the prices up, it's made it uneconomic for the majority of people to purchase beef. So yes, they are moving to becoming self-sufficient, but it's on the back of prices are going up and it's uh, becoming too expensive. Here is a uh, photo of a uh, Indonesian uh, supermarket with some of our product, and more importantly, as I touched on earlier, our manufacturing-based product was going into these meatballs here that you can see that were available on the average side of the road for anybody to eat. That's become a thing of the past now because they can't get uh, any cheaper material to go in them and they're having to because of the export quota. The rest of the markets are pretty small. I'm not going to dwell on them too much. I mean, the South Pacific, uh, New Zealand here is still a strong domestic chilled market for us. Uh, we put a lot of our cuts strip loins, cube rolls, table meats, what we would call. The Middle East is growing, uh, certainly uh, in our Bobbyville, uh, which the industry itself is growing as well on the back of that we have an increased dairy cow. Now, I guess the one that everybody's been interested to, to hear about, China and where it's come from and where it is today and where it's going. Uh, as you can see there, undoubtedly the star performer of global lamb, <laughs> mutton and beef. Alliance has a strong history of uh, dealing in the Chinese market. We've had a presence in there now for well over 12 years. Uh, and we believe that we have. It's taken us a long time to find the appropriate right partners, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Uh, it's not a market that you can go into it. Dame Jenny touched on it. If you are going to go in, you have to make sure that you have the right people. Uh, it's taken us a long time to get where we are today, but we now believe that uh, we're very well established in there. As far as export figures uh, for the industry go out of New Zealand, we are and have been leading the charge there for quite some time. However, having said that, with the demise of USA in there, it now opens up for everybody uh, to go in there. We are fielding constantly three or four inquiries on a daily basis uh, from everybody who has a friend of a friend or <laughs> to wish to start doing business up there. And I mean, it, it's you have to pay homage to them. You cannot just cut them off at the knees and say, look, we don't want to deal with you. We'll, we'll sound them out. But we now have a variety of customers up there. We have about eight in the beef scene and we've got about three or four major customers on the lamb scene. As, as I touched on earlier, our largest client as a company is based in China and uh, they are to the value of $100 million last year. So it is a significant uh, market for us. And as I go through these uh, graphs, you'll see why. So they've gone from, uh, again, Dame Jenny touched on the low hanging fruit, which is a, a very common term. So it, it's the cheaper end of the market. And for us, I guess, for those in the cattle trade, you're talking about the, the flaps, the navels, and all the cheaper end of product. They've moved on from there, and they're now starting to move 
higher in value as well. On the lamb side of things, as you can see there, uh, they're starting to take shoulders, full carcasses, racks, legs, and a number of other products. As far as uh, importing into China goes, you can see there that five countries have been cleared for export into China. This is what we would deem through the front door, not through the uh, back door. So Brazil, Uruguay, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Now Brazil at the moment uh, has most of their product being consumed domestically, so they are not a, a major player. With the USA and Brazil now out of the market, imports from Australia, New Zealand, and Uruguay have ramped up considerably. Chinese official import statistics show that the country recorded 70,000 tonnes of, of beef last year with market shares as follows. Uh, Australia 45, Uruguay 26, Brazil 13, and New Zealand 12. 12, 13 were thereabouts. Below is a graph showing the dramatic run-up in monthly. So you can see there for 2010 was small, 2011 was even smaller. 2012, October, November, December, it started to uh, jump considerably. And then in January for 2013, there's been 20,000 tonne of product going there already, uh, which is significant. The beauty, I guess, uh, should you find the right customer in uh, China, is that most of them will pay you cash up front prior to you putting the product on the water. So you, you can't get a better uh, relationship with your customer if they're going to pay you cash up front even before you put product on the water. Um, and, and in today's society, obviously, for us as a company, we're having to procure, compete for uh, animals to, in order to slaughter, and then at the same time we're also having to compete in the market as to where we place it. So uh, there is surplus capacity in New Zealand, so it does make it tough competing for animals or, or farm gate. However, obviously if you have markets like China who are going to assist and pay you uh, prior to putting product on the water, it does allow you to make one or two decisions that you would normally not make. Till re recently, as I said, uh, USA beef, particularly grain fed, which is the majority of uh, product that comes out of uh, USA, uh, featured highly on Chinese menus. But again, all of it was in through uh, the back door. There's been, as I say, a recent tightening of border controls has changed the way and, and uh, from New Zealand and Australia now, it's led to where we're such a, a significant performer. The other advantage that New Zealand has over Australia is that we do have a free trade agreement. One of the first countries to have a free trade agreement with China, and that is significantly uh, meaning that we're paying less duty and it makes it more attractive for the Chinese customer to come to us first. Uh, prior to the past 18 months, beef sales have predominantly been shank. Uh, roasting mussels and all that for soup. Uh, other items were generally too expensive, but as time has evolved, uh, China now imports a wide range of variety. The point end brisket, the navel end brisket, the loin cuts, uh, 100 visual lean, which is red meat, knuckles, chuck roll, etc. And we're, they are, or China is quickly dislodging their Asian neighbours. What it means for Alliance Group? Um, on the lamb side of things, you can see there that they are our largest client, 24% uh, of our market share. Uh, and this year, for the three months that we've had, they are even more significant. They've grown to 27%. Now on the other side of that, on our mutton cuts, it's even more uh, noticeable. They've grown from 32% at the end of 12 months, and in three months now they are at 62%. So uh, what's going to happen in the second half of the year is that countries that have previously taken uh, product from New Zealand are actually going to struggle a little bit in finding it. Uh, predominantly on the ovine side of things, Europe, uh, UK has been our largest market for a long, long time now. And through one reason or another, they've had some issues, um, obviously with their currency and, and a number of other issues going on there. And they've been using New Zealand companies basically as a bang. We will slaughter it, hold it, until they're in time ready for us to ship it. However, you may well find later in the year that when they come to procure their product for the second half of the year, it's actually not going to be there. On the beef side of things, uh, it's not quite so noticeable, but it is changing. Again, these are our own alliance group 
um, figures, which almost dovetail the industry ones that you saw before. A lot, uh, United States is 43% to the end of, it says 2011 there, but basically that's the end of our operating season as at September last year. So if you look at the 2011, China is nowhere to be seen. Uh, they don't exist, and that in three months, or it's actually five months from uh, October through to today, you see that they've now come on board as number three. I personally believe that uh, by the end of this year, China will be second uh, behind North America. And depending on how well the relationships go and the business that we've... Time moves on, yes. <laughs> I've only got... Uh... This is our largest customer. This is a company called Graham Farms, which is based up in Harbin. Um, the premises that they've had there are only about five years old. Now, the significance of showing you this is that they have a lot of investment with uh, domestic and uh, local government puts a lot of fund into it. But this building that you can see here is in the far left of the complex. That is a uh, plan of how he ex expects to expand his business within the next five years. So the, bus the previous slide that you saw is up in the, or sorry, in the bottom left. And uh, he has a, his own feedlot. Uh, he has venison uh, feedlot as well. And the last two slides are, or three slides are this is his factory. It's come a long way as time has evolved. It's not quite where we're at, uh, New Zealand and Australia are at yet, but it's not too far away. You can see there that obviously uh, they're all in white. Um, this is further processing lamb and mutton that we've sent up. We sent a lot up now in carcass form. Uh, I apologise for the photos, but uh, you can understand that they are moving on and then I wasn't too far away you did very good. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, hopefully it's been enlightening for you and given you a little bit of um, what's going on in the market here today and again uh, we'll be available for questions Yeah, thank you, Grant, for that very good and, and uh, informative talk. And we'll get time for questions. And on it now, our next uh, next item on the agenda is the Canadian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. None like Bert. You may come as a, as a surprise to you that I didn't attend at university, so my report won't be 50 minutes long. <laughs> it may also come to as a surprise at you that my report will be probably regarded as quite short. But anyway. My report comes from, on behalf of the President, Council and members of the Dairy Shorthorn Association of Australia, it is with great pleasure that I give you this report at our second World Conference. Good day from Australia. Since our last report to the conference, Dairy Shorthorns in Australia have been enjoying increased growth in both registrations and memberships. Although still a small breed in numbers, we, be, we believe dairy shorthorns still have a valuable role in the Australian cattle industry. The Dairy Shorthorn Association of Australia has re received many benefits as a result of our involvement in the 13th World Conference, where many valuable contacts were made. As a result, communications continue today with individuals and organisations to the extent that we, the Dairy Shorthorn Association of Australia, feel that we are not an island, but a part of a global shorthorn family, which has mutual benefits. A major factor 
in the increased awareness of dairy shorthorn breed in Australia began from an inquiry to take part in a rare breeds farm that was being set up in, by the National Trust of Australia. A farm in southwest Victoria was bequeathed to the National Trust for the sole purpose of preserving rare and endangered species of farm animals. A small herd of females was loaned to this trust, which opens the farm to the public on a regular basis. As a result of our involvement with the farm, the Australian Dairy Shorthorns were selected as a possible candidate for the Slow Food Arc of Taste, which is an international organisation. Dairy Shorthorns were later accredited and received international exposure. This led to the Dairy Shorthorn being fe featured by the uh, national broadcaster, of the ABC, on their TV rural program, Landline. The dual purpose qualities of the Australian Dairy Shorthorn were featured with coverage of both the milking side of the breed and the beef side of the breed. These events were the catalyst of unprecedented inquiry and, in, and demand from all over Australia and also international inquiry for traditional dairy shorthorn genetics. Currently the dairy industry, oh, pardon me, uh, as being a dual purpose breed, we do have a, a beef side of um, our, our breed, but I feel sure that uh, our other fellow family members being the beef shorthorns and the pole shorthorns will give um, relative uh, information on the state of the beef industry in our country. Currently, the dairy industry in Australia is at a, at a low point. A combination of less than adequate milk price and the, and the high Australia dollar, as compared to other countries making exports invite, uh, less inviting to overseas markets. Currently, in southern Australia, we have an organisation that has formed calling themselves Farmer Power which is disenchanted with the current farmer organisations in respect to achieving higher milk prices. A groundswell from, from producers sees the current situation going, gra pardon me, gaining momentum, with both state and federal governments be, being pursued with the end goal of my, higher milk pay. Our association, as, as I would imagine, other short horns organisations around the world continue to have a goal to increasing the number of younger people involved with their breeds. The Dairy Shorthorn Association is no exception. The Dairy Shorthorn Association leaves this meeting in, with the confidence that the breed in, in Australia is progressing. In concluding, we would very much like to thank the organising committee of the 14th World Short On Conference for the inv invitation to attend and the hospitality they have extended to us all. We look forward to being part of the 15th World Short On Conference and look forward to seeing as many of you as possible. We won't say goodbye, just see you later, mate. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, now, our next speaker is from Beef and Lamb New Zealand, and Richard Wakeman. Richard is General Manager of FARM with Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Richard is responsible for research investments on behalf of levy payers and the development of extension programs for farmers. Richard is also responsible for the gen genetics investments by Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, certainly is my pleasure to be here uh, this morning for the 14th World Shorthorn um, Conference and celebrating 200 years of, uh, of Shorthorn. So what I'd like to start this morning with is uh, just taking you through Beef and Lamb New Zealand, our vision, which is a growing sheep and beef industry providing uh, sustainable profits for future generations. 
and our mission is uh, delivering innovative tools and services to support uh, informed decision making and continuous improvement in market access, product positioning and farming systems. Beef and Lamb New Zealand is by farmers for farmers. Beef and Lamb New Zealand belongs to New Zealand sheep and beef farmers and is funded by farmers who invest together to benefit the whole industry. It is guided by farmers through their Farmer Council in the regions and our farmer elected directors. This collective investment and oversight delivers uh, outcomes to farmers that couldn't be achieved alone. The red meat sector in New Zealand is big. It contributes around $8 billion each year to the New Zealand economy. The success of the red meat sector is critical to everyone who lives in New Zealand. Beef and Lamb New Zealand is the farmer organisation that plays a critical role at many points in the value chain, providing ind independent information, tools and services that can help farmers make the best business decisions. We deliver these, uh, these activities through the four programmes, farm, market, people and information. My role as General Manager Farm, I look after the uh, research, development and technology transfer uh, for whole farm systems. We have our market um, uh, division or our market program uh, which looks after both market access and market development. Our market access program is very much uh, working with the regulators, um, developing and, and making sure that uh, technical policy and trade policy uh, is developed in the best interest of the producers. Our market development uh, investment, we work alongside um, exporters, the, uh, the, um, uh, the companies, uh, processors and marketers of, of New Zealand's red meat. We don't uh, own any product, we don't um, uh, go out there on our own, we work in, uh, alongside of the, uh, the processes in that area. In terms of our information program, uh, many of you will see out on the, up on the back um, desk there, there's a little um, uh, booklet like this, which is the um, Farm Facts. Uh, this one's a 2012 model, I'd uh, uh, encourage you to pick up a copy of it but also there's a website there where you can get access to the latest one which is uh, due out at the end of this month, uh, next week, early, early the following week. Uh, and this is uh, the information that we collect from our farm survey. So we have a team of uh, about 15 or 16 um, uh, out in the regions and there's uh, seven of those that are involved directly with uh, surveying um, the uh, sheep and beef farms across New Zealand uh, in order to produce uh, information which uh, helps uh, the uh, farmers in terms of from a technical policy and trade policy but also uh, a lot of the market work as well. Our people program uh, is very much focused on uh, developing future leaders for the industry, uh, working with young people uh, and uh, that's one of the, the points I really wanted to make. It's come through this morning a little bit, but the importance of young people in our industry. So much uh, focus goes on growing the potential of our herds and our flocks, um, but we also need to um, ensure that we focus on our people and our young people. I've been in the industry for uh, more than 30 years, and for a long part of my career I was growing towards the average age of farmers. Um, but unfortunately in the last probably seven or eight years the average age has actually continued to move ahead as, uh, as I've got older as well. Uh, and it's one of the real challenges that we have in our industry. Our programs are very much about making continuous improvement on farms, securing better access to overseas markets uh, and evaluating the status of New Zealand beef uh, to boost the demand for red meat. What I'd like to do this morning is uh, just go through um, uh, a couple of areas. I'm not going to go into too much detail right across our programs. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background to industry. Much of the statistics have um, been uh, worked through. I'd like to talk a, a little bit about our red meat sector strategy and then I'm going to, to concentrate on two areas which is uh, our research and environment programs. Uh, in terms of um, uh, farm numbers and size, 
Um, there are uh, about 12,500 commercial sheep and beef farms in New Zealand, and that compares with 1984-85, uh, where there was 22,000, so we've seen a decline um, of 43% uh, in the number of sheep and beef farms, and uh, this has very much um, uh, been at the, uh, at the growth um, of uh, the urban sprawl. We've also seen a, a increasing number of um, dairy farms, but also um, the emergence of uh, things like lifestyle blocks and, and things like that. Average stock units have gone up, so we've gone from 3,500 stock units in 84, 85, uh, through to average stock units of 2011-2012 uh, of 4,000, so we've seen a 17% increase. In terms of the number of dairy herds, they've gone from 15,881 down to 11,798, which is a 26% um, decline in the, um, the number of um, um, dairy herds. And the average cow uh, at peak have gone up from 144 to 393. So we've seen this um, aggregation. There's been a significant level of aggregation in the dairy uh, sector. Um, which has actually uh, seen uh, a lot of those um, um, properties expand and not only um, taken in the, the size of the properties but they've also had to increase the amount of um, um, dairy grazing that's actually taken on. So dairy grazing has become an, a, an important part of uh, the New Zealand sheep and beef farms. The other area that we've actually just started collecting data on has been the, uh, the co commercial horticultural, uh, horticulture properties as well, so uh, 7,000 uh, horticulture, and this is uh, recognising the increased focus on um, New Zealand as a, a food production nation. One of the interesting statistics I heard uh, just the other day, last week at, the, uh, at, a, at a committee meeting, was that there is a significant volume of green feed that has been grown in the horticulture sector uh, which is actually not for human uh, consumption, but it's uh, grass-fed, uh, grass-based systems that have been uh, grown in horticulture that is actually going in for animal feed as, as, as well. Just wanted to put um, this slide up, which uh, is um, rather sobering for, for those of us who work closely with the, um, with the industry, and that is uh, just, I'm not sure whether that's going to show up on the on the board but this is a graph that we put together um, a couple of years ago um, comparing farm profitability between 1990 91 and 2008-2009 when we were working with our statistics in New Zealand we used 1990-91 as a base year for for our figures because uh, up until the mid 80s um, um, New Zealand uh, had a um, had uh, support systems in place and from the mid-80s, um, New Zealand was fully exposed to international markets for, for all of our production. And we believe that uh, it would took through until about 1990 for the effects of, um, of some of that uh, market uh, protection uh, to actually fully um, play out into the system. So from 1990, 91, uh, New Zealand sheep and beef farmers were absolutely on their own and, and, and competing uh, on, a, on a free market. And so 38% uh, of the 19,500 farms were in the hill country. Uh, in 2008, 2009, we've dropped down to 12,800 farms and there's 48% in the hill country. And what we saw with the blue bars, that was the, the, the distribution of profitability. And we saw that it was very narrow. So we had uh, a lot of farms actually, uh, there wasn't a lot of variation in profitability. And what we've seen in 2008-2009 is the widespread in farm profitability. And so uh, whilst we continue to focus, uh, can anyone see that on, the, on the, the bottom left hand side there in terms of the low level of profit, one of the things that we noticed uh, when doing this analysis was up in the right hand side is that even in the, uh, the, the economic climate of 2008-2009, there were still from some farms out there that were actually making a lot of money. And so um, what we were seeing is that the variation in price wasn't actually um, having a big effect on the variation in profitability. And so one of the opportunities that we saw was to um, develop a lot of our programs towards how we can actually narrow up that gap. How can we actually reduce the level of variation? 
as an industry good organisation, not um, focusing, uh, not being able to intervene on, on, on pricing, what we had to do is to, what can we do, what can we develop, uh, what, what uh, systems can we put in place for sheep and beef farmers to help them deal with the variation in profitability. Uh, and so this is where uh, a lot of our programs have been uh, focused towards. In terms of the red meat sector strategy, so this was launched um, by the uh, Prime Minister and Chairs of the Meat Industry Association and, and Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Uh, it was launched in May 2011. And the red meat sector uh, strategy was a report that charts out to 2000, uh, 2025 um, to see a substantially transformed uh, industry. The report identifies some big opportunities and uh, puts some others into perspective uh, in terms of where the opportunities were. One of the things uh, I guess we, we were trying to make uh, also in terms of reporting back following that report is that um, this is really hard. The sector is complex with many different pr products, participants and markets. Um, when we, do, we look at, uh, and again the, the speaker from Alliance was uh, talking about the, the various cuts and the various values, um, we're dealing with a very complex product that actually can end up by going into lots of different markets from, from, from one carcass. There is no silver bullet uh, and there is no one size fits all solution. Uh, however, uh, we have to change the way that things uh, have been. In terms of the red meat sector strategy findings, um, there were three key themes. Uh, theme number one was increased coordination of market behaviour, uh, efficient and aligned procurement, and sector best practice. When we look at the, um, the, the, the different components, the coordinated in-market behaviour, behavior, we knew that uh, there was areas there of growing the share of market value, so it's not necessarily producing more, but it's actually about uh, getting a better share of the value that is produced. Uh, getting better access to markets, uh, and again, the speakers have talked about uh, some of these emerging markets and, uh, and what the opportunities that actually lay there, and it's how we actually um, get ourselves organised to, uh, to get ourselves involved in those. Making better use of scale, and again we've heard about uh, things like um, capacity in terms of different times of the year when uh, there isn't enough capacity, it's very narrow compared to the rest of the year. Selecting what to sell, increasing the certainty of supply. And there were three areas that were probably targeted more towards behind the farm gate, uh, which was improving, improve on-farm productivity, uh, improving business skills and developing farmer systems. Again, some of our studies identified that there is an opportunity in increasing the number of farmers who are actually um, developing and putting together business plans in order to um, um, uh, put, put into their business. And this was, a, a, again, looking at that uh, previous graph I just showed before about the variation in, in farm profitability. This is an example of what could be achieved. So if we looked at the variation, so that, that graph, uh, if you, you think about the graph and the variation of farm profitability, if we look at that another way, and uh, see that if we were actually able to take um, this group of farmers there, and not take everyone to the top, but just lift everyone up to that 70th percentile, that's worth about another $180 million um, of, of profit before tax. Uh, in terms of how do we actually improve that variation in, in, in farm profitability. So that's one of the real aims uh, and, and the challenges that we have as an industry going forward. And uh, Beef and Lamb, is, uh, is, as a farmer organisation, uh, we are charged with uh, investing farmer levies uh, and developing tools and services that actually can help bring those, that change about. So I'd like to talk now just a little bit on our uh, research and development program. Um, we have uh, six main areas uh, of our um, uh, research investment uh, as our organisation. Uh, improved forage and feed efficiency, uh, more productive and efficient sheep, more productive and efficient cattle, uh, reducing the impact of internal parasites, dairy beef integration, and sustainable land and environment management. Uh, today I just uh, just uh, in the interests of time, 
Uh, I'm just going to talk about three of those things, which is improved forage and feed efficiency, more productive and efficient cattle, and sustainable uh, land and environment management. In terms of um, uh, Im improving um, uh, forage and feed efficiency, um, one of our flagship uh, investments is Pastoral 21. This is a five-year program that covers both sheep and beef and dairy research objectives. A lot of our research programs, um, we work collaboratively, not only uh, alongside a government, but also alongside other uh, sector uh, groups as well. And so this one, uh, we work quite closely with um, the Dairy, in Z Dairy New Zealand, Fonterra, um, and also um, the um, Dairy Company Cooperative Association as well. Um, the main objective is to lift farm productivity by 3% per annum on sheep and beef farms uh, with lower inputs and more sustainable farm systems. Uh, our objectives is very much uh, improving early spring feed supply on the hill country, um, evaluation of forage establishment methods for uncultivatable hill country with um, co um, a concentration on legumes. One of the challenges that we've had is that uh, land use, as land use has changed, that more and more of our sheep and beef farms are, um, are, are having to operate on uh, hill country and harder hill country conditions. And this affects not only our uh, forage uh, systems, uh, but also later on when I talk about some of our environmental challenges as well. It's about spring management uh, strategies for lucerne, uh, novel legumes for hill country, and winter feed management. So that's a, a, one of the, a, a very big program that we have running. Um, we have a number of uh, research sites, uh, particularly uh, in, the, uh, in the Waikato. So we've got uh, some work going on at uh, Whara Whara, uh, just out of Hamilton. Uh, we've got some work going on on the east coast uh, of the um, uh, North Island, uh, just south of Hastings. And uh, we've got two or three sites uh, in the South Island where we're looking at what are the things that we can do um, to actually improve the early spring supply of um, feed on uh, hill country systems. The other area, the second area, is improving uh, summer, summer autumn feed quality. Um, and uh, this is very much um, evaluating different spring management practices on some, and uh, the impact that this has on summer um, uh, feed quality. It's about uh, identifying what we can do earlier on um, that'll have the maximum opportunity for our summer feed uh, supply. Our third area, which is uh, improving pro uh, profitability through integrated farm um, planning. Um, so this is looking at mixed livestock systems um, that improve the, the integration of land management units to increase the profitability of average hill country farms uh, and four different land classes. So again, we're looking at those different areas um, um, from um, sort of upper North Island through to uh, lower east of the uh, North Island uh, and then looking at our, our South Island uh, land classes as well. Um, it's uh, very much taking into consideration the different times that uh, we need to apply some of this new research uh, findings. Uh, and then how do we actually start demonstrating that to, uh, to farmers and some of the systems that we put in place for that. Our fourth area is called breakthrough technologies and, um, and these are the uh, technologies that are around step change. So how can we um, develop um, totally new technologies that hadn't been thought of and, and people today have been talking about um, Twitter and Facebook and, uh, and even email. Um, and if we look at the uh, generation of or, or the evolution of technology that's happening in the e-space, um, we also need to start thinking about what is the evolution of technology that's actually going to ha happen on the farm space. So what are the new things that we need to be looking at um, that we can apply either through tools um, and, um, uh, and systems. Um, in the early Pastoral 21 work, we, uh, we had a program which was called Pastures from Space, um, which uh, always drew a bit of a snigger from, uh, from audiences when we talked about that. But that was actually looking at using some of the satellite technology that's whizzing around up there uh, in terms of using that to uh, start to understanding pasture cover, pasture growth and things like that. Now, whilst at the time that, that experiment um, became increasingly difficult because of um, the technology and, uh, and, and, and what it was developed for, 
that research that has actually then led on to the development of um, a, a tool that uh, we, we're just about to release, which is a, a pasture growth forecaster. Uh, and again, like a, a lot of these new technologies, um, um, this will be a totally new way of, uh, of being able to use um, NIWA or um, the weather forecast, forecasting data, land use, um, soil information from uh, land care, uh, and Farmax, uh, which is a pasture management system, to actually uh, predict what future pasture growth is going to be. Now, um, again, it's one of those things that was actually all set to uh, release just prior to Christmas, uh, and then we had once in a we've had a once in a life uh, uh, drought across most of or all of the North Island, and uh, now emerging into parts of the South Island. And wouldn't you know it, the algorithms wouldn't work for data that it never ever seen before. So we've had to go back to the drawing board. But what it does is it's actually been extremely promising because it's actually told us that it was correcting cor correctly, but just not fast enough. Okay, and that was because the data, the bottom end data, had never ever been collected before. And uh, so we've actually learned a huge amount with the event of this um, this drought, unfortunately. Uh, in terms of uh, more productive and efficient cattle, um, we've got uh, four quite large programs going on there, which is the production costs of cuperia and cattle, cow, effic cow efficiency in hill country breeding herds, um, profitable and sustainable systems for intensive wintering, wintering of cattle on hill country, cow size, milk production, efficiency of calf production. So uh, these programs are, uh, are ongoing, and I know uh, I see on the program that Rebecca Hickson is going to be um, uh, speaking to you today or tomorrow, and uh, and I know that some of the work that uh, she's been working in is, uh, is some of the uh, uh, investments that we've made into to that area. I'll just talk through a couple of them. Um, drench resistance in Cooperia is widespread in New Zealand. It is rare to find a farm uh, which does not have a resistance to the um, uh, to the drenches and about uh, all, uh, three quarters also have white drench resistance. So what are the trials? In this trial of eight mobs, uh, we run an independent farmlets from uh, January to December over two years. All eight mobs were uh, drenched routinely, um, which controlled other worms, but not uh, cuperia. Uh, in addition, four mobs received an oral com combination drench um, to control uh, cuperia. Uh, live weights, condition scores, um, faecal egg counts and larval numbers on pasture were measured throughout and, larva, and live weights coming out of winter were significantly heavier for those calves which were given the additional treatments with the oral combination to control cuperia. Um, and um, interestingly enough, um, by December some of these differences had actually uh, reduced um, which were not statistically significant um, but there was some sort of uh, catch-up in growth, which is um, uh, quite an interesting part, and we're looking to repeat that, um, that, that work. In terms of cow efficiency on the, in the hill country breeding herds, this project aims to measure the effects of cow breed type and beef, beef production efficiency in contrasting f um, farm environments. So it's taking into consideration um, the different hill country systems um, and, uh, and understanding what's actually going on that. The results will give farmers clear objective information to make informed decisions regarding the most profitable type of beef cow to farm and the importance of measuring um, the correct production variables to make these. So it's actually giving, helping farmers um, provide the decision tools uh, that they need to be thinking about uh, when making those decisions. Um, profitable and sustainable systems for in, uh, intensive wintering of cattle on hill country. Um, Increasingly, the impact of environment of wintering cattle in wet hill country is being questioned. Um, nevertheless, uh, hill country sheep and beef cattle farmers have fuel alternatives, as cattle are needed uh, on these farms to control pasture in the late spring uh, summer period. Profitable and sustainable wintering systems are needed for farmers in these environments. Animal growth rates, together with their impacts on pasture production, soil conditions and water runoff will be evaluated and four different cattle wintering systems will be in, uh, identified and enrolled in the project to provide comparative data. So that's uh, some work that we're doing in that area. In terms of the environment, just very quickly, <laughs> 
time marches on, I hear this morning. Um, just there's four areas that uh, we're working on, land and, uh, and water uh, forum, uh, beef and lamb New Zealand uh, on behalf of farmers have been very heavily involved in the uh, land and water forum, industry groups, environmental and recreational um, NGOs, iwi, uh, which is um, uh, Maori uh, interests, uh, scientists and others with a stake in freshwater and land management. And there's been a, a developed a, a shared vision and common approach and a 2012 report of Fresh Start uh, for Fresh Water. We also have the Beef and Lamb New Zealand Environment Strategy, Life Cycle Analysis, Tackling Climate Change and Sustainable Water Management. Um, just uh, the environment is a, and sustainable farm systems is an absolutely critical issue for, for farmers everywhere. And, um, uh, and increasingly, um, regulators are having a, uh, a bigger role in uh, determining um, uh, farms, uh, farming systems. And the challenge we have is, uh, is one of uh, not regulation, it's actually around education. Because uh, often the regulations are actually being put in place without necessarily a full understanding of the impact and all the information. So as a farmer representative organisation, we've, we're con increasingly working closely with the regulators to help them to increase their understanding um, of the impact um, of, of uh, their regulations on the farming communities. And uh, it's a real challenge because worldwide, farmers are actually the best stewards of the land. No farmer goes into their farming business without looking to the future. Um, in terms of their objective to pass the farm on in a better state than they've actually found it. And so the real challenge for us as an organisation is how we can actually build that close relation. The other thing is how do we build a, a better understanding of urban uh, about farming. Um, you know, many years, not too many years ago, most people in the urban areas knew someone who lived on the farm and increasingly now we're seeing a greater separation between that relationship between the urban uh, and the rural sector in terms of the challenge that we have is how we can actually bring those closer together. Just uh, finishing, Beef and Lamb New Zealand developed a land environment planning toolkit uh, which is an, a documented assessment of a farm's land and environment issues and plan. Uh, it plans what actions need to be taken, where these actions need to be targeted and when they'll be implemented. It's a three-stage plan. Uh, level one is very much a self-assessment. Um, level two is uh, workbook-based. Uh, and level three, uh, you'll probably need specialist support. Um, and land environment plans um, are about working uh, closely with the local regulators and, uh, and uh, informing uh, them on what has actually been done on the properties. So thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to talk this morning and um, only too happy to take questions. But again, just help yourself to one of these books which has got uh, fabulous uh, facts and figures on uh, New Zealand farming systems. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.